Well, good morning, folks. We are Don and Donna Mole, and we are just so happy to be here. We want to say thank you so much for letting us come and worship with you this morning. For the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes, we're going to be hammering on some strings. We're going to sing you some songs, and we're going to be telling you some stories in between. And we're going to start it out with a song where the title says it all. We're only here for a little while. Gonna hold who needs holding, mend what needs mending. Walk what needs walking, though it means an extra mile. And pray what needs praying, say what needs saying, cause we're only here for a little while. Today I stood singing songs and saying amen, saying goodbye to an old friend who seemed so young. He spent his time working hard to chase a dollar, putting off until tomorrow the things he should have done. Made me stop and think, what's the hurry, why the running, don't like what I'm becoming, gonna change my style, and take my time, and not take it all for granted, cause we're only here for a little while Gonna hold who needs holding Mend what needs mending Walk what needs walking Though it means an extra mile And pray what needs praying Say what needs saying Cause we're only here for a little while Like as precious as a child Take my hand Let us reach out to each other Cause we're only here for a little while Gonna hold who needs holding Mend what needs mending Walk what needs walking Though it means an extra mile And pray what needs praying Say what needs saying Cause we're only here for a little while Because we're only here for a little while How many have never heard us before? Oh, there's quite a few. Yeah, it's been a while ago. <laughs> well, We've been doing this for about 30 years, and as we travel each weekend, a lot of times folks like to know what we do for a living. We just do this on the weekends, about 48 or 49 weekends out of the year. We pack everything up on Thursday after work, and then as soon as we get done on Friday, we head to different parts of the country. I think next weekend is Nebraska, right? <laughs> well, Don works with wood. He builds cabinets and furniture and things like that. And for about 16 or 17 years, he's been building these musical instruments full time. Folks were often asking where they could get these old-fashioned Bible instruments. So he started out building a psaltery, like Psalm 150 talked about the psaltery and the harp. Well, that little triangle-shaped instrument is a psaltery. And he built two of them, and the very next weekend the Lord blessed, and he sold them both. So he kept building more. I think he's working on number 397 right now. Each one has a little different tone because of the type of wood and the sound hole design. He also builds the mountain dulcimer like I'll play on my lap. He builds these hammer dulcimers, and he started building something else a few years ago, too. After a while, we'll hold them up so you can get a better look at them. My part is to help put the strings on. And I'm a nurse. I currently work as a nurse practitioner at a little urgent care clinic just two days a week. So that makes it possible for us to travel like this each weekend. And we lived over in Missouri for many years in the Ozark Mountains. So a lot of the music that we do is Ozark Mountain kind of music. <clears throat> when we first started doing this 30 years ago, there were five families of us who would travel. Maybe once or twice a month it was kind of a challenge to get 20 people all together going in the right direction. But one of those families was Joyce and Dennis Barrett. 
And Joyce and Dennis had a daughter, and when she got to be about 13 or so, they had a son. And when little Ricky was four years old, they got a big surprise, and they had a set of twins. (laughs) Their quiver was full. (laughs) But Dennis had a problem. He had a hard time controlling his temper. And he wanted to be a, a patient father, But it can be a challenge when you have a teenage daughter and a strong-willed four-year-old and twin babies. Well, Dennis prayed about it and tried and worked on it, and it just didn't seem to help. And he got so discouraged, he even quit praying about it. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and run with patience the race set before us. Well, he was trying to run his race with patience, but he was losing the battle. He forgot the very next verse that says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Well, one night the Lord gave Dennis a dream, and in this dream he reminded Dennis where the power really comes from. All of God's biddings are enablings, aren't they? Just like we were talking about in Sabbath school today. If he asks something of us, he provides the power to do it. And when Dennis woke up, he was so encouraged. He wrote the words to this song, gave it to us to put music to. It's a song of victory. It's called Answer in the Snow. As I lay me down to sleep last night, I didn't stop to pray. God would never hear my prayer, the things I'd done that day. He'd forgiven me these very things a million times before. And yet I kept repeating them, could he forgive me more? I slept and as I dreamed I heard God's questions put to me. How far is it from east to west? How deep the deepest sea? What is the limit of my love at Calvary expressed? What is seventy squared seven times? How wise a sin confessed? Covered with his light, whiter than snow, fullness of his love, then shall I know. My life is scarlet. My sin and woe, my sin and woe, covered with His love, whiter than snow. Voice excited by my ear said, "Dad, it snowed last night." Look, it covered everything And made the ground all white And there before my eyes I saw God's answer in the snow There is no limit to His love No mortal man can know Covered with His love Covered with His love Whiter than snow Whiter than snow Fullness of His love Fullness of His love Then shall I know Then shall I know My life is scarlet My life is scarlet My sin and woe My sin and woe Covered with His love Covered with His love Whiter than snow Covered with His love Whiter than snow Whiter than snow Fullness of His Fullness love of His love Then shall I know Then shall I know 
My life is scarlet. My life is scarlet. My sin and woe. My sin and woe. Covered with His covered light. Covered with His light. Whiter than snow. Covered with His light. Whiter than snow. I'm going to tell you a story about a wealthy man. Now, this wealthy man had decided to take his son on a trip to the country to show him what it was like to be poor. So they spent a few days and nights on a farm with a family that was considered to be poor. And when they returned home, the father asked his son, how'd you like the trip? And his son replied, it was great, Dad. So then the father asked, well, did you learn or notice anything on this trip? And the son thought for a moment, and then he said, I noticed that we have one dog. And they've got four. We've got a swimming pool, but they've got a creek that never stops flowing. We light up our backyard with lanterns, and they've got the whole sky full of stars. We live on a little piece of ground, and they've got fields that go beyond our sight. We buy our food, and they grow theirs. And then the son paused again for a moment, and then he looked up to his dad and said, it showed me how poor we really are. This is a song about how rich we really are. Well, I hear tell the millionaires and billionaires and such who gathered all their treasures and still did not have enough. If money could buy peace of mind, I guess they'd have it all. And all the money in the world won't hold you when you fall. We've got a roof over our heads, and the kids have all been fed. And the woman I love most stands close beside me till the end. Lord, give me the eyes to see exactly what it's worth. And I will be the richest man on earth. Lord, when I wish I had the things that you gave someone else, I pray that you'll forgive me for just thinking of myself. I haven't been as thankful as I know I ought to be. I should be more than satisfied with all you've given me. We've got a roof over our heads, and the kids have all been fed. And the woman I love most stands close beside me till the end. Lord, give me the eyes to see exactly what it's worth. And I will be the richest man on earth. One thing is for certain, it don't matter when you die. Well, if you had a million... Or if you just got by We've got a roof over our heads And the kids have all been fed And the woman I love most Stands close beside me till the end And Lord, give me the eyes to see Exactly what it's worth And I will be the richest man on earth I will be the richest man on earth. Well, do you like a good story? <laughs> Me too. This is a true story. It happened either in 2007 or 2008. Anyway, it made the 2008 Trial Lawyer Story of the Year. There was a man in North Carolina who had a weakness. He loved to smoke expensive cigars. He should have known better, huh? <laughs> but he couldn't afford them. Oh, but he craved them. So he decided 
that he would splurge and buy two dozen of his favorite Cuban cigars. Price tag, $24,000. Well, that's a big investment. It is stupid. (laughs) It's a big investment, so he decided he should have it insured against things like theft and loss and fire. (laughs) Well, he sat down and he smoked them all. And then he turned in the insurance policy claiming that they had all perished in a series of small fires. <laughs> well, you know the insurance company didn't want to pay that claim, so it went to court. And the judge in the case said, this is the most ridiculous case I have ever tried. But that insurance policy is ironclad, and you're going to have to pay him that money. So they wrote him a check for $24,000. Well, he took it to the bank, and just after he cashed it, there were federal agents there ready to arrest him on 24 counts of arson. (laughs) Sometimes justice is served, isn't it? (laughs) But it's sad to say that many times justice is not served. I heard of another case recently where a man went to prison for over 20 years for a crime he didn't commit. And there was plenty of evidence to prove his innocence. But the judge in the case refused to admit the evidence to court. So he went to prison. And for over 20 years, they tried to get a retrial. And they finally got it accomplished. And this time, they admitted the evidence to court. And it was proven beyond doubt that he truly was innocent. But the most amazing part of the story to me is that after they released him, they interviewed him. And he said, I don't know why God wanted me to go to prison for something I didn't do. Maybe I needed to be there to be an encouragement to someone else. I think that attitude is a miracle, don't you? Well, there's another court in session as we meet on this beautiful Sabbath morning. But in that heavenly court, no mistake will ever be made. Because the one who made us, the one who judges us, knows not only the things that we do, but the motives of our heart and the circumstances of our lives. And when we stand before the judgment seat, we know every decision will be right. And Jesus says, My son, give me thine heart, so that he can have the privilege to stand as our defense attorney. And when our crimes come up before that judgment seat, he can say, My blood, Father, for them. But the news is even better than that, because the Bible tells us that the Father has given all judgment to the Son. So when we look behind the judgment seat, Jesus himself is our judge. If we allow him to be our defense attorney, and he is our judge, there's no way we can lose. We have nothing to fear if we just surrender to him. The Bible makes that point in a lot of different ways. But my favorite one is found in the book of Leviticus. I think it's about chapter 25. Every 50 years in Israel, when it was a theocracy, they had this special year. It was called the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, all the slaves were set free. All of those that had gotten themselves into debt, the debts were canceled. All those that had sold their family farms, the farms reverted back to the original families again. I think we could use some of that today, don't you? Well, what a beautiful picture that is of what Jesus does for us. He sets us free from the slavery of sin. He took our place, paid our debt, so that we could have what we don't deserve. Jesus is our jubilee. The Lord provided for a time for the slaves to be set free, for the debts to all be canceled so his chosen ones could see. His deep desire was for forgiveness. He longed to see their liberty, and his yearning was embodied in the year of Jubilee. Jubilee, Jubilee. Jesus is our jubilee. Debts forgiven, slaves set free. Jesus is 
our jubilee. At the Lord's appointed time, his deep desire became a man, the heart of all true jubilation, and with joy we understand. In his voice we hear the trumpet call, tells us we are free. He is the incarnation of the year of jubilee. Jubilee, jubilee. Jesus is our jubilee. Debts forgiven, slaves set free. Jesus is our jubilee. To be so completely guilty and given over to despair. To look into our judge's face and see a savior there. Jubilee. Jubilee, Jesus is our jubilee. Debts forgiven, slaves set free. Jesus is our jubilee. Jesus is our jubilee. It's been about 12 years ago was our first time to go out to California. Now, the folks in California really didn't know if they wanted this style of music in their church or not. But they went ahead and let us come in. And uh, we did a song for them called When We All Get to Heaven. And it went something like this. smiling and said, y'all come back now. <laughs> we had a really good time with the folks here in California. In fact, about a year and a half ago, we were back out there in California, and I think we did about 14 or 15 concerts out there, and we had a good time with the folks there. Hey, before we go on to the next song, how many of you folks would like to know what these instruments are? Oh, thank you, because I wouldn't know what to say if you said no, so I'm glad you do. i tell you what we're going to do. We're going to raise up the ones we can, because we know that you know what some of these are, and when we raise them up, you tell us what they are, okay? How about this one right here? A dulcimer. What type of dulcimer? No? 
she's giving you she, a lap dulcimer. Very good. It's also called the mountain dulcimer. And the difference between the mountain dulcimer and the lap dulcimer is, is when you're in the mountains, it's a mountain dulcimer. Very good. Yeah. And when you're on the flatlands, it's a lap dulcimer. So to, to this morning, eh, it's probably a lap dulcimer. How about this one right here? Sultry, yes, very it. good. That is a bowed sultry, just like they talk about it in the book of Psalms. We read it this morning. And, uh, you know, they talk about the sultry and the harp and some of the other instruments that King David played. Well, that is a sultry. And everywhere we go, we always tell everybody that's the sultry that David played. <laughs> of course, we're talking about our son, David, is who we're talking about. How about this one right here? It starts with a Z. A zither. zither, yeah, zither. that's really close. Yeah, it's called a zither. They started making the zithers back in the late 1800s, and all you do on a zither is you pluck the notes. Early 1900s, they came out with an auto harp, and some of you know what an auto harp is. And actually, the auto harp took the place of the zither because they made it easier for folks to play. To play uh, On the auto harp, you push the notes down, then you strum the strings. On the zither, you have to pluck each note out. How about the one here in front? That's a hammer dulcimer. Yeah. Very good. Well, we're going to go ahead and do a song that we enjoy There's playing. There's one more back here, too, but I can't reach it. Oh, that oh little yeah, one, this one right here. You know what this one is? Mm. Whoops. Mandolin. Mandolin. Yes, yep. that's a mandolin. Donna's brother builds mandolins, by the way. I just want to let you know that. He <laughs> built that one for us, and we're glad he did because we enjoy playing it. We're going to go ahead and do a song that uh, we enjoy playing, and Donna will play all four of the instruments, I think. Okay? It's called Sweet Hour Prayer. <laughs>
asked Elaine what time we should quit, and she says, well, everybody's staying for lunch, so. <laughs> 2 p.m.? You, to, <laughs> <laughs> we asked, it to, we, we were at a little church one time here in Missouri, and I asked the head elder, what time should we quit? And he said, when you start smelling the food. <laughs> We have two more songs to do for you. I want to say thank you so much for letting us worship with you. We do hope at least one of the songs so far has touched and blessed you in some way. We have so much fun traveling like this each weekend, and I love to study history. So I did a little study of the history of Mount Pleasant, and it was named because the early Indians called this Pleasant Mound. And so that's a beautiful name, isn't it? Mount Pleasant. <laughs> well, we were driving through Kentucky a while back, and we drove past a place called Boonesboro. Who do you suppose that made me think of? Daniel, Daniel Boone, very famous American historical person. Well, when I study history, I want to know more than just names and dates and places. That is boring. I want to know personal details about the people. How about you? Well, I studied into the life of Daniel Boone. Did you know that Daniel Boone hated coonskin caps? He thought they looked hideous and he would not wear one. <laughs> it's said that he played a mountain dulcimer, and I can believe that because I know that that instrument originated here in America, over in that part of the country. When the settlers came from Ireland and Scotland, they wanted something that sounded like bagpipes, because as they came across the ocean, the salt water ruined their pipes. And so they developed that little instrument to kind of sound like a little bagpipe. Well, I think if Daniel Boone hadn't known how to play that beautiful sounding instrument, he would have died a single man. He was looking around the neighborhood for a wife, and he caught the eye of Rebecca. But before he would take the big step to formally court her, he thought he ought to check out her character to see what kind of wife she would make. So he began to do things to her just to irritate her to see how she would react. Gentlemen, I don't recommend it. <laughs> he did several things. One day he took a knife. He was an expert throwing a knife. And he took aim and he threw it. And he put a great big hole right through Rebecca's cambric apron. That was a big insult. Cambric was very expensive store-bought material. And the girls would save their money and buy this piece of material and make the perfect apron to become someone's wife. And she knew he did it on purpose. Well, Rebecca's daddy did not like Daniel Boone, as you can imagine. <laughs> he tried to talk her out of marrying him. He said, Becky, honey, you don't want to marry that Daniel Boone. He's a traipsin' man. And you don't want to marry no traipsin' man. Well... I don't know if it was his dulcimer playing or what it was, but she decided to marry him. And sure enough, Daniel Boone was a traipsin' man, wasn't he? They started out there in, in Carolina, moved to Virginia, finally ended up in Kentucky. And they were there for a while, and Daniel decided it was getting too crowded. There were over 20,000 people in the state by then. <laughs> they needed to move further west. Anybody know where they finally ended up? No, should have been, shouldn't it? Should have been Mount Pleasant. This was um, Davy Crockett territory, though. <laughs> no, it was um, just not far from St. Louis, Missouri, over in the Marthasville area. And that's where Daniel died, or uh, Be Rebecca died first, and they buried her there. And a few years later, after he'd paid off all their debts, Daniel died, and they buried him beside his wife. But after a while, the folks in Kentucky decided that just wasn't right. Daniel Boone belonged to Kentucky. So they decided to go over there and dig him up and take him back to Frankfurt. But the folks in Missouri didn't appreciate the gesture. And when those Kentuckians showed up, they neglected to tell them that when the headstones were placed, a mistake had been made. And they dug someone up and took him back to Kentucky, but it wasn't Daniel Boone. <laughs> and they proved that back in 1983. <laughs> Well, it has been said that we are traipsing people because we traipse around the country about every weekend. But we learned about traipsing from the very best. Our Savior Jesus himself was a traipsing man, wasn't he? Yes. He left heaven in the glories of that celestial place to come to this little dark earth to live and to die for our sins because he loves us so much. But he didn't stay in that grave. 
He rose again, and just before he went back to heaven, he left us a commission. He said, Go ye into all the world. Tell them what I'm really like. They've got the wrong idea. Time is short. They need to hear. We need to take that seriously, don't we? Take his message of love wherever he would send us. Maybe across the street or a different county. Maybe a different part of the world even. But wherever it is, if he sends us, he'll make the way possible so that they can know that Jesus loves them too. Hitting the road one more time Leaving my friends and my family behind I sure never do this for nobody but you And string my guitar and pack up my clothes And get in the van and then get on the road I'd never walk out the door if it wasn't for you But you left heaven for me Hit the roads and the shores of Galilee And gave yourself at Calvary So I've got to go and tell them what you've done for me Mexican food Motel rooms, short nights and long afternoons I sure never do this for nobody but you Loading it for, focus the lights And get ready for one more night I'd never walk on the stage if it wasn't for you But you left heaven for me Hit the roads and the shores of Galilee And gave yourself a Calvary So I've got to go and tell them what you've done for me You left heaven for me Hit the roads and the shores of Galilee And gave yourself a Calvary So I've got to go and tell them what you've done for me Yes, I'm going to go and tell them what you've done for me One of my very favorite things to study when I study history is Civil War history. And a while back, we were over in Georgia. It was January, and it was beautiful. The camellia were in bloom, and it was warm. And back home in Missouri, it was icy and cold and dark and dingy, and I was wanting to be away from there. So we got to be over in in, uh, Georgia. And we had a few extra days, and I looked at the map, and I saw a place there that I had always wanted to visit. I love to study Civil War history, and I love to go from battlefield to historical site. Don has absolutely no interest in that at all. So he humors me and lets me go. And I said, look, it's not very far. Can we go? And he's like, okay, we'll go. (laughs) Well, it's not too far from Amerigus, Georgia. Not far from a little town called Andersonville is this prison camp. And if you've studied Civil War history, you know about the Andersonville prison camp. I know that there were notorious, horrible prison camps in the North, too. But this is one that I have some family connection to. And when we went there, I had studied about it and I knew some things, but it was really interesting to see them firsthand. This prison camp was thrown together early in the war to house a few thousand because everyone knew the war wasn't going to last long. But that isn't what happened, is it? It went on and on. And after several months, there were over 10,000 people housed there. 
when they first began to arrive, there were no stockade walls. So a line was driv- or, uh, drawn around the outside perimeter of the camp, and it was called the dead line. And anyone that got too close to it was shot dead. That's where the term dead line comes from. So they were forced to build their own stockade walls. And the only water source for the whole camp was a little creek not even as wide as the area between the pews here. And it came down the hill and ended in a marshy area where the prisoners had to be. No shelters, very little food. The people of Andersonville knew the men were dying and they would come and throw food over the walls trying to help. If you see pictures of some of those prisoners, it looks like Auschwitz or Dachau. Just nothing left of them. And the water, as it came down the hill, came right past the latrine of the guards. So every drop of water was contaminated. And most of those who died at Andersonville died of exposure and dysentery. Nearly 13,000 casualties of that prison camp. And there are horrible, unmentionable stories of things that happened there. But there's also some pretty amazing miracle stories. One night, in the midst of a Georgia thunderstorm, there were some Christian prisoners on their knees praying, Father, please send water. We need water. And all of a sudden, lightning struck just inside the stockade wall and out flowed this cool, clear spring. And it still flows today. They built a little monument there. They call it Providence Spring. Well, there was a man in the prison camp, one of the prisoners, that was given the job of keeping track of everyone who died there. Dorrance Atwater, he kept a faithful list. And his captors told him, when the war is over, the list will go to Washington. And it was important, because if the widows and orphans could prove where their loved one died, they could get a stipend and they wouldn't starve. And he kept this list. And he didn't trust his captors, so he kept a second secret list. And when the war ended, the first list disappeared. And when they finally found it, it was missing lots of names. But he had his list. And he went to Washington and tried to get someone's attention, but nobody would listen. There was so much commotion going on. But one of the Eastern newspaper writers wrote a story in a a newspaper, Horace Greeley. And a very famous Civil War nurse by the name of Clara Barton heard about it. And she's a relative of mine. And Clara found Dorrance Atwater, and together they lobbied Congress and got manpower and funding to go back to Andersonville and exhume the bodies and positively identify them. And when you go there now, at the visitor center, there's a list, almost 13,000 names. And beside each name is a number. And if you go up on the hill where the graveyard is, There are numbers on the little markers, and you can find where your loved one was buried. Well, we were there in January of 2005, just a few days after that big tsunami struck in Southeast Asia. And at that time, they said 100,000 people died in that big tidal wave. Now looking back, we know it was closer to 300,000 precious souls whose lives were snuffed out in a moment. No warning. And we stood in that marshy area and looked up at that graveyard, little marble or, I guess, limestone markers shining in the Georgia sun. And I thought, this is 13,000. What is 100,000? What is 300,000 precious souls? I can't comprehend numbers like that, can you? And it happens every day. We hear a little of the news, these horrible things that happen in our schools in countries where there are no safety measures, earthquakes, floods, right here in America, people drowning because they didn't see the the road closed sign. And Jesus sees everyone, and it breaks his heart. We are so homesick to go home, aren't we? Go home to heaven. But I think there's someone a whole lot more homesick than we are, and that's Jesus himself. I can almost hear him talking to our Heavenly Father. Father, is today the day? Can I go get him? And one of these days, Jesus is going to say, or our Father is going to say, Okay, son, go get him and bring him home. Lately, 
I've been thinking as I look all around me. I see by the signs that we're soon gonna be leaving. The bridegroom is coming to take us all away. Maybe it's tomorrow. I pray that it's today. We will fly away in the twinkling of an eye, leaving all our sorrows, telling them all goodbye. We will fly away. When he hears his father say, Jesus, go and get your bride. Today is your wedding day. Now, when we see the bridegroom on the clouds in the sky. Will he be telling you hello, or telling you goodbye? Oh, be sure and be ready to meet him face to face. We've got to fight the good fight. We've got to keep our faith, so we can fly. In the twinkling of an eye, leaving all our sorrows, telling them all goodbye. We will fly away when he hears his father say, "Jesus, go and get your bride." Today is your wedding day. We want to mention to you that we have a website, and that website is folkmountaingospel.com. We'd like to have you go and check the website out. And while you're there on the website, there's a guest book there, and we'd like to have you sign the guest book and tell us if, we, if you received the blessing or not. Folks, thank you again for letting us come and worship with you.